All right, good morning. How are we doing today? Hallelujah, there we go. So did everybody, I guess, float to church this morning? God's blessed us with a numerous amounts of rain. We're going to trust that he knows we need it. One highlight. In a couple of months, you're going to be wanting the rain, right? As we get started this morning, Mother's Day is coming up. Guys, every year we order Mother's Day roses. If you're interested in doing that, please see Casey. Go to her directly. There is no kind of sign-up sheet or anything like that. She's just going to put it in, and she can explain the details. The details are also in your bulletin, okay? Uh, the dessert auction, youth dessert auction, is going to be May 8th. Make plans on being here for that. That's always a, a great time and a lot of sweet food to eat. Uh, the Care Closet Ministry, May 3rd and 4th, they're going to have that open. You can see the times in the bulletin as well for that. Today, if you have no other plans, even if you do, please plan on staying after church for a business meeting. It should be fairly quick. There's a few items on the agenda, but should be pretty quick. I am going to end by reading out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, and it's very appropriate for today, but it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God, we come to you and we thank you, God, for that assurance. We thank you, God, that even through all this rain and through everything that's going on, God, that we can trust you no matter what happens. Thank you, God, that we have a place that we can come that's dry, that we can come and worship you, God, and serve you today. We look forward to what you're going to do for us today, this week, God. Just protect us as we go out. Help us to honor and glorify you in everything that we do in all of these things. Amen. All right, if you want to stand with us for worship, you better be ready to sing loud today, all right? Looks like everybody got washed away. It'll be all right, though. At least my favorites are here. That's good. Divides to the depths of the sea. Creation revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. You're all powerful, untamable. Awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laying with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom. Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. You're all powerful, untamable. Indescribable, uncontainable. 
couple of weeks, um, I've asked everybody on the team, and going to keep asking everybody on the team to uh, to pick set lists, and Jacob picked, and Jack picked, and today is uh, Larry's picks. These are Larry's favorite songs that we do, and uh, when we did this song the other night to practice, I love this song. It's one of my favorites, because if you don't know 
anything about Jesus, anything about the gospel. Um, this song describes it to you perfectly.
Jesus, we thank you. God, I thank you for these wonderful praise songs. God, I thank you that you alone are worthy of the praise. Lord, I pray that today it's not directed at anything, at anybody except for you. Father, you are holy and you are mighty. God, and we love you so much and we thank you so much for choosing to save us, for choosing to love us, and just doling out, pouring out mercy on us. Father, as we sit in this typhoon, Lord, as we sit in these raging waters, Lord, I pray that you would help us to think about it, just picture that this is how you desire to pour out your mercy, not just a small shower, but, Lord, that you would just pour out mercy and blessing. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
All right. And the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's how it feels, right? Washed out and waterlogged. Um, before we get started, before we release our kids and everything, a few things uh, to discuss before business meeting. It's not really uh, financial business to the church, but a few things I want to make you aware of. Um, number one, um, Mr. Alex Mitchell is here today. He is flying solo uh, because his wife had a baby. And so we are super, super excited. She is gorgeous, uh, looks just like her sister. Um, and so no denying who the dad is, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and so I just want to make an offer uh, to all of you, if you would like to help provide meals for them. Steph is still a little down and out. I mean, she's up and she's, she's going good. But uh, if you'd like to help provide meals, also if you'd like to love on them, uh, shower them with diapers and gifts and stuff, just contact Alex. He's at the house. Um, and you can, you can swing that stuff by. I know they'd appreciate it. Um, secondly, and these, these, are not, these are not happy things, but I wanted to make you aware of a few things. Um, Ms. Heather Little is not here today. She is with her mother, Diana, um, both members here. Um, Diana's husband, Richard, passed away um, this past weekend, and so uh, Heather's been taking care of her mama. And um, for those of you that knew him, um, longtime youth pastor and uh, deacon here, Randy Lewis, Bubba Love Lewis, uh, passed away early yesterday morning. Um, and so I have reached out to Delia. Um, for both of those families, we are uh, preparing to do a, um, a visitation for Diana. And I have also opened it up for Delia. I sent her a text and just said, hey, whatever you need from Anthony Drive, the church is at your disposal. Uh, I know some of you didn't know Randy, uh, but if you did, uh, he changed your life, guaranteed. And so um, just be praying for those two families, please. It's been kind of a rough weekend. Um, also be in prayer, and I want to stop service now, and I want to just say a special prayer uh, for Christy Adair. Christy is back at the hospital. She's over in Waxahachie now. Um, she'll get transferred to Big Baylor tomorrow, um, and they are going to put in a pacemaker. So her heart has been uh, acting, acting all funny. So they're going to put in a pacemaker, and hopefully that's going to give her a whole bunch of relief once they get everything leveled out. And so um, Mike came in this morning, and I, I told Mike we were for sure going to pray for her. And so I want to stop service now and just say a special prayer for her, if you're able. Uh, would you bow with me and let's, let's go to the Lord. Father, we just come to you, Lord, right now. God, and I pray for Christy. Lord, I pray that you would just bless her body. Lord, I pray, God, that you alone know the reason why she's had to endure all the things that she's had to endure. Father, you alone have those answers. And Lord, we just pray. God, that if we are not supplied with answers, Lord, that we would be supplied with peace. And Father, I just pray, God, that you have given these doctors and these nurses the wisdom to move forward with this, Father. And since they are moving forward, we trust that they are moving forward in your plan. And so we pray already for the surgeon. We pray for their hands. We pray, God, that you would just give them peace. Lord, I pray that you would just watch over Christy, that you would just allow her body to... Uh, have no reaction or direct uh, positively to the, to the surgery. Father, I pray for Mike and Macy. I pray, God, that as they tend to her and love her and care for her, Father, I pray that you would just give them a comfort and a peace in this entire situation, knowing that her hands are in doctor's hands, but ultimately that her life is in your hands. And so, Father, we trust you, the great physician. Lord, we trust you and we, we ask this blessing. Lord, I pray for peace over Diana. I pray for peace over... Heather, God, I just ask that you would just watch over them and, and, and just, God, help Richard's passing. God, help it to be as, as gentle and smooth on Diana as possible. Lord, I pray for Delia and the boys now. God, I just pray that you just, God, that you would help them along in, in a difficult time. Lord, I just love you. God, I don't doubt you. I don't question you. And so, Lord, I come to you now just thanking you and praising you for everything that you have done, even the things that I don't understand, the things that I can't comprehend. Lord, I sit in thankfulness. And Lord, I just pray that you just watch over us. God, help us to just be a blessing to each of these families. Help us, God, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right. If you are a child here, 
ages three through third grade. You guys can get ready to go back now. Our kiddos three through third grade. Glad we get to smile this week. Uh, for those of you that have a kiddo younger than age three, uh, that our nursery is down that same hallway. Miss Alice is back there. Goodbye, ma'am. And as always, I like to mention this when it's allergy season, uh, there's a room set up in the back if you choose to keep your kids in here, or like me, if you have a fun time with allergies, uh, that room is set up in the back where you can still be a part of service, and you can go cough and cry to your heart's content. Maybe you just need to cry, I don't know. Um, that room is set up for you. All right, Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28. Before I get angry texts and phone calls... Um, because it'll happen, I want you to know this is not pointed, directed at anybody, um, because you're going to call me, and you're going to go, that was at me. It's not. Um, This is the joy of walking through the Bible chapter by chapter, is I never can say, hey, it was my fault, and I directed this at you. Um, But sometimes it just so happens that the perfect word comes up at the perfect time. Um, And so I just kind of trust God to deliver that word. I also don't want to fixate on the negative. Um, I know sometimes I'm not the best encourager. Stop it. Uh, Sometimes I'm not the best encourager. Sometimes, guys, listen, there's a lot of churches that will tell you you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, and they're going to tell you that everything is just peachy in life. Um, The word talks about our sin. It talks about how awful our sin is. It talks about how depraved we are. It constantly reminds us that we are not God and shall never be God. Um, And so I hope that you get the full counsel of that here. Now, in saying that, I hope that I never fixate on the negative so much that you leave worse than you came in. I hope that you never go home and go, God, like if you got beat up, if you got convicted, that's on you. But if you were like, man, that preacher, he just, he's depressing. I, I hope that's never the case. Isaiah chapter 28, he shifts here, Isaiah shifts here just a little bit. He's been talking about the glory of Jesus in that day. And you're going to hear in that day again, it's going to start off in that day. We've been talking about the victory that comes in, in, in Christ. And so that's an exciting thing for those few chapters. Now he's going to shift And he's not going to talk about, if you've been with me for a while, he's not going to talk about the oracles against other nations, and he's not going to talk about the glory to come. Now he's looking at his own people. He's looking at Judah, he's looking at Israel, and he is condemning them, saying, look, this is the reason that you are about to be taken captive. This is the reason that you're going to have to deal with 70 years of slavery. This is the reason that all of these things are about to transpire. And so he's pointing straight at them. He says it this way in the English Standard Version. He says, Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. Now let's stop right there because I want to talk to you about who Ephraim is. Um, Ephraim was a son of Joseph. Let's go through biblical history just a little bit. So you have... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham is the father of Isaac. Isaac is the father of Jacob. Jacob has a whole slew of boys, right? Jacob has a whole bunch of kids. One of those kids who is his favorite son, his name is Joseph, all right? He's second to youngest. He's the favorite. If you know the story about Joseph and his technicolor dream coat, that's it, okay? His father makes him a coat of many colors. He's loved. His brothers hate him. They despise him. They throw him in a ditch and they try to sell him, or they don't try to. They sell him off into slavery. And Joseph becomes the second in command over Egypt. And the boys have to go to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. And Joseph is able to take care of them and love them. And, and they, they finally reconcile. And Joseph becomes a man of stature, a man of prominence. Well, Joseph has two boys. And Joseph's two boys' names are Ephraim and Manasseh. All right? So Ephraim is the younger. Manasseh is the older. So as Jacob, Joseph's daddy, is getting ready to die, Joseph takes his boys and takes them to his father and says, I want you to bless my boys. Right? Customary, he puts Manasseh on his right side 
He puts Ephraim on his left side because he's going to lay out his hands on the boys' heads. He's going to bless them. Well, as Jacob goes to bless the boys, the Bible says he swaps his hands. And Joseph goes, no, 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 dad, 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 no, 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 I got it right. And Jacob looks at him and says, I know what I'm doing. And he blesses the boys, and he blesses that Ephraim would receive a double portion, that he would be doubly blessed. He completely swaps around the birthright of the boys. Fast forward to the land of Canaan is occupied by the people. Every tribe has its piece of land. Ephraim has been given a land that is fruitful. It is the greatest, most opulent piece of land. It is amazing. And so Ephraim's people have flourished and they've gotten so large that the northern kingdom of Israel often in the Bible is just referred to as the land of Ephraim because there was just so many people there. And so as the other clans get smaller, they serve the people of Ephraim. So I wanted to backstory that on why, number one, it ties in really well with what we're doing on Wednesday nights, but number two, why he's going to just refer to them as Ephraim and who Ephraim is. Ephraim is not your hillbilly cousin, okay? Ephraim is the people, the largest tribe of the northern kingdom. And so he says, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. The head of the rich valley would be Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. And so he looks and he says that this town is so phenomenal and it's so built up and it's so gorgeous and so beautiful. He says it's like a crown that sits on the head of Israel. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong and like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters, he cast down to the earth with his hand. Listen to me. I could not have played this any better if I chose these verses. So if you need to understand the destruction that is pointed at Israel because of their drunkenness and their debauchery, just go outside. The Lord says, like a strong tempest, like terrible waters, I'm going to annihilate everything. Some of you live in the country. Some of you almost had to hook up the boat to get to church today. I applaud you for being here. Because listen, I was laying in bed and that storm was going and I looked at Tasha and I was like, they'll understand if we just call it off. But it's business meeting day. It's my favorite day of the year. So I got up and I got dressed and I came, right? We all want to have that business meeting. But God says, there is a storm coming for Israel. And I am going to destroy, like the rush of water, I am going to completely wipe out. He says, that proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, look at the repeat. It literally repeats from verse 1. He's adding emphasis. He's just pushing. He says, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When someone sees it, he swallows it as soon as it's in his hand. God says, I'm just, it's gone the minute it appears. He says, I'm so sick of your pride, and I'm sick of your drunkenness, and I'm sick of this debauchery. He says, in that day, the Lord of hosts, in that day, there's the, there's the call to the future. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory, a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. These also now reel with wine and they stagger with strong drink. And the priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed up by their wine. They stagger with strong drink and they reel in vision. They stumble when giving judgment for all the tables are full of their filthy vomit with no space left on them. 
to whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. If that makes no sense to you, I'll break it down a little bit easier because I was pretty confused with this chapter. Just going to be honest. God looks and says, I'm so sick of your drunkenness. I'm sick of your celebrating. I'm sick of your pride. I'm sick of it. And the first mention of that is mocking, that the people are mocking the Lord. They're looking up and they're going, he tells us that we need to learn his word, precept upon precept, line upon line, this a little and that a little. Does he think that we are children? Does he think that we are babies just being weaned off of milk? You can, you can hear the pride dripping off of the people. That Isaiah has come to them and said, these are the easy commandments of the Lord. And you can't even do the easy commandments. How are you going to do the complicated things? How are you going to understand the depths of his mercy and his love when you can't even handle the little things? And the people look at him in this prideful smile and they go, you're talking to us like we're children. You're looking at us with these building blocks like we're babies. We're not babies. We're not those at the breast. We're not those drinking milk. We're grown men. We are kings. We are princes. How dare you speak to us like this? And guys, I'm telling you, I don't want to fixate. But there's enough of us here that have this problem that we have to address it. The Bible says that they are confused. They are confused. This word is the same word, the exact same word that we just read in chapter 25. In chapter 25, we celebrated. If you go back just a few chapters, we celebrated because the word for confused is actually the word to be swallowed up. And in chapter 25, it was celebration time because he has swallowed up death forever. And I told you, it wasn't just a small thing that when Christ took care of death, he took care of it completely. He swallowed it up and we all went, amen. So here's the problem. In chapter 28, Isaiah uses that word again, but he uses it to talk about drunkenness. Guys, I need you to understand something. And I'll be the first one. Look, I'm not that old Baptist. I, I, I'll be the first one to stand here and tell you the Bible never says don't drink. It says don't be drunk. Now listen, for some of you, that means don't drink. It just means don't drink. It tells us not to be a gossip. For some of you, that means you have to keep your mouth completely shut. I'm just being honest. It tells us not to be a glutton. For some of us, we have to put locks on the fridge. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that the Bible tells us not to do. And it's easy for us to walk in and get really offended at our sin. Because if we fixate on that sin, it's really easy for that sin to be offensive. I told you before, this is the problem I have today with the church with homosexuality. That's like the sin, right? And we look and we go, oh, these people can't be saved. Well, time out. Time out. If they reject their sin and they chase after Christ, they're just as saved as me who rejects my sin and chases after Christ. Now, the problem is you have people that come in and go, well, how come you get to get married? How come you get to be in a relationship and you tell me that I don't? 
Because one is holy and one is not. All right, listen to me. That same mindset goes for drinking. Well, why do you get to have a drink? Because it doesn't control me. Because it doesn't control me. I don't wake up in the morning thinking about drinking. I don't go to bed at night needing a drink so that I can drink. I don't need a drink so that I can deal with my family. I don't need a drink so that I can process. I'm not sitting at work thinking about the money I'm making. I don't factor in my drinking into my budget. It does not control me. And so the Bible says for me, and actually, if you want to point fingers before you shoot your angry text at me, listen. The Bible tells me I don't get to drink. I'm a pastor. I don't get to. And you can ask my wife. When we go eat Mexican food, it's sweet tea. Last night was really sweet tea. <laughs> like hurt my teeth. I had to go home and brush my teeth sweet tea. The reason for me is not because it doesn't control me. It's because of position. I have no problem having one drink. The, the, the deal is, though, if I sit down and you see me drinking, somebody with that issue is going to look and go, oh, it's good for him. I don't want to cause my weaker brother to stumble. And so if they see everybody else around me drinking and they see me drinking sweet tea, they at least go, okay, I can sit and talk with you. Plus, I learned a long time ago, I just don't really like the taste of it. It's not enjoyable to me. I'd rather have a Dr. Pepper. God gave us Dr. Pepper. Why would you choose anything else? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You live in Texas. Guys, I'm going to tell you, the fear of drinking. The reason the Bible, so the Bible talks about two things consistently. Consistently. Those two things are sexual sin and drunkenness. It puts those two things together a lot. Do you know why? Because those are the two things that we as humans struggle with the most. Those are also the two things, and you're not going to convince me otherwise, that if you get caught up in them, they will eat you up. They will devour you. And the Bible says, Isaiah looks at them and goes, this has become a problem where your pride and your debauchery sits before God and God is looking at you going, you are swallowed up in this. He says, you're like a flower that is fading away. You had so much hope and so much promise. He says in verse 7 that they reel with wine and they stagger with strong drink. The priests and the prophets, they reel and they're swallowed up by it. They stagger with strong drink when they reel in vision. And they stumble in giving judgment. And the table is full of vomit. What does alcohol do to us? Number one, alcohol kills your ability to see the future. It just does. And if it doesn't kill your ability to see the future, I guarantee you it kills everybody around you. It kills their ability to see the future. It's important that we note that our sin doesn't just destroy us. No sin is ever self-contained, ever. And so how is my sin affecting the people around me? If you're a mother... How is your sin affecting your children? Let me just say, I'm not going to condemn you for having that drink. What I will say is this, for all you moms who have the shirt that, you know, I love Jesus, but I drink a little. I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. That glass of wine that you need to relax may not have any effect on you. But your children who see you medicating nightly with a bottle of wine, who you don't know if your children are going to carry the gene of alcoholism, you don't know if they're going to have trouble with alcohol abuse. But I saw mom do it, so it must be okay. This is how mom got through trouble. This is how dad coped. 
This is what dads do. They take their 30-pack, they go sit in the garage, mom takes care of us, and dad drinks. That's what dads do. For a lot of you, that's what dad did. Dad was the first guy who, when you were 13, 14, looked at you and said, sit down. And it was like some badge of manhood. He handed you your first beer, and he's like, there you go. And started you on a course. Listen to me. Pray with your children. Read to your children. Love your children. Go fishing with your children. Don't start them on a course that could set them out for destruction. Well, it didn't do nothing to me. Good for you. Just because the grenade didn't blow up in your hand doesn't mean toss it to your children. It's such a dangerous thing. And so when we talk about this, guys, it jacks up your ability to see a future, their ability to see a future, and it clouds your judgment. You will do the dumbest stuff when you're drinking. I'm just going to let you know. And I'm not going to sit here and point all these fingers because, you know, if I point one finger at you, i got a whole bunch pointing back at me. My children, I, I almost need them to leave the room because I hate telling stories on myself of before Jesus. But their mama, let me tell you, <laughs> guys, we, we were there. We were there. We were those kids in high school. My parents didn't drink. I, I've never seen my parents take a drink. They sure weren't, they, they weren't drunks. But you get around your friends and your friends are doing it, right? And all of a sudden you're like, okay, here we go. I'm a smart guy. I'm not trying to sound egotistical. I feel like I'm a fairly intelligent person. Guys, when I was drinking, I was an idiot. I was the dumbest, I, I'm the, I was the dumbest dude ever. I'm not going to glorify it, but I'm going to tell you, I did things now that if my daughter does them, you'll never see her again. <laughs> Wiped off the face of the earth. And I did them because of alcohol. Things that I would never do sober-minded. And I look back and I just lament. If the lights go out, it's okay. I can preach with them on. We don't need the microphone. Sorry, Facebook. Um, but I lament over those things. I look back at areas of my life where I look and I go, man, I, I just failed. And when we talk about this, the judgment that I should have had and how all of that flew out the window, the things that I could have been free from, the things that I could be free from today, but because of alcohol, it drug me into something else because my judgment was wrong. I want to give you an assessment really quick. This is not biblical. This is worldly assessment. It's called the cage screening for alcoholism. It's how to know if you're on the verge of being an alcoholic. All right, you ready? Cage, C-A-G-E. Number one, have you ever felt that you should cut down on your drinking? That's the C. Have you ever sat there and been like, man, I feel like I should cut back? Do people annoy you when they criticize your drinking? That's the A. Are you annoyed by people when they talk about your drinking? The G is, have you ever felt guilty because of your drinking? And the last one, do you ever need an eye-opener, E-Y-E? An eye-opener is a drink in the morning to help you get over the night before. Those four things, that's the cage method. When they ask people if you're an alcoholic or not, okay, those are the four questions. Now, here's the deal. Let me just be honest with you. Can I be like super blunt? If you heard those four and you listened to me and when I got done you went, whew, passed the test. Only one applied, not all four. If those questions are even in your wheelhouse, if you were sitting there listening to me going, am I an alcoholic? You have, you have an alcohol problem. If when I said, here's how to know you're an alcoholic, if you went, tell me, Pastor. 
you have an alcohol problem. Because the people in here who don't have an alcohol problem went, this does not pertain to me, not one bit. Right? I mean, let's just be honest. I go to a men's conference and I sit down and the preacher gets up and goes, today we're going to talk about gluttony. Okay. Here's how to know if you eat too much. I can go home. I don't have this problem. Do you constantly think about food? And I'm like, I forget to eat, right? I would sit there and it would just, it, it would just go in and in and out the other. So if I just said, here's how to know you're an alcoholic, and you went, well, this doesn't apply to me at all. Why are we even talking about this? Good job. If I said, here's how to know you're an alcoholic, and you went, we got a problem. And you're starting to have a problem. Or you're all the way into a problem. Or, praise God, you're coming out of a problem. And you went, that was me. And the greatest feeling ever, the worst feeling ever is, that's me. And I hope nobody in here finds out, but that's me. The best feeling ever is, whew, that was me. And thank God, thank God that that was me. And that's not me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. If you have your Bibles open, let's go to the New Testament for just a minute. Ephesians 5, 15. Paul is going to hit. He is talking about walking in love and loving one another. He's talking about what we should be in Christ and what we should not be in Christ. He talks about how, and I'm just going to hit y'all with it. If you go back and you look at verse 4, he says that no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, none of these things should come out of your mouth. So if you need a slap in the face on what you need to be as a Christian, go ahead and just read through Ephesians 5. No one that is sexually immoral or impure, no one that is covetous, no, no idolater, none of these people will have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Don't become partners with them. You should hate what they do. It should be repulsive to you. And then he goes on in verse 15. He says, look carefully at how you walk, not as wise, or not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He hits and he says, this drinking is debauchery. Debauchery is an old school sounding word, right? That's the old school preacher word. You kids, y'all, you and your debauchery. And you're like, what does debauchery mean? Debauchery means to be abandoned. That one hit. If somebody told me I was caught up in debauchery, I'd be like, all right, whatever. I don't even know what that means, old man. But when somebody looks at me and says, your alcohol abuse your alcohol use is going to leave you abandoned. It's going to cause you to live an abandoned life. You're going to find yourself alone. And the problem is, when you had, you drank. When you have not, you drink even more. Because now you mourn the things that you had, and the only friend that you have is alcohol, and alcohol is always there. And guys, I'm going to tell you, that is that abandoned life that it leaves you in when you look around and you realize nobody's there. I had a buddy, have a buddy, that for the longest time I wouldn't answer his phone calls. I just wouldn't. He would call me, and when he would call me, he would say, hey man, I need, I need a ride to Walmart. He wouldn't ask me to go to the liquor store because he knew I wouldn't take him to the liquor store. I need to ride to Walmart, and you ride to H-E-B. And I'd take him to Walmart, and he'd go inside, and he'd come out, and he wouldn't buy anything. He never bought anything. We did this like three or four times. And I was like, so you need to ride to Walmart, but you never buy anything. And so one day I confronted him about it. I said, hey, man, he came out, he got in the car. I said, hey, what is the deal? I said, what are you doing? Are you going in there, like, cashing a check? Like, what? I, I keep bringing you to Walmart. What, what are you doing? 
and he just starts crying, and he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a bottle of vanilla extract. And I said, what is this? He said, vanilla extract is like 75% alcohol. He said, I can't steal from the alcohol aisle because there's cameras. He said, but I can steal the extract. He said, and I can fit it in my pocket, and I can get out with it. He said, there's no alarms on it or anything. He said, this is the only thing that I can get my hands on to get any kind of a buzz. He was drinking bottles of vanilla extract daily just to numb. Guys, when I say that it leaves you abandoned, now that you've told me this, the next time you call me and say, hey, I need you to take me to Walmart, dude, I'm not taking you. He lives alone. He walks to Walmart to feed an addiction that has robbed him of his wife, his children, his business, everything. And I personally, we have sent him to AA. I have loved him through rehabs. And until he is ready to be done, he won't be done. He loves me and I love him and my heart breaks for him. The Bible says that it will be an unrestrained life. A drunken life is one that is at odds with the Holy Spirit. In fact, from Paul's words here, it stands to reason that it is impossible to live in a drunken state and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the problem I have, no offense, to my charismatic friends when they say to be drunk in the Holy Spirit. The Bible actually says that those two things sit at odds with each other. And I get what they mean, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's such an issue... Because there's no way in this state of mind, there's no way in this way of life that I'm fully serving Christ. Because Christ tells me to look carefully at how I walk. He tells me in Galatians that self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. That if I am indeed filled with the Holy Spirit, that my joy comes from Christ and I have self-control. Here's the good news. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. If you go back to Isaiah 28. And I'm expecting a couple of people in this room to amen. There is freedom in Jesus Christ through alcoholism. There's freedom from it. There's freedom out of it. It's not a fun road. It's not an easy road. You know, when Jesus told you to take that narrow road, what He neglected to tell you was that narrow road goes up a mountain and down a mountain and up a mountain and down a mountain. It's a very narrow path. And it's not a short path, and it's not an easy path. That wide road to hell, it's paved, man. It's easy. You can stroll down that dude. That narrow path, it takes effort. But look at what God says. In the midst of the judgment, in the middle of chapter 28, I didn't write this in the notes, but it just hit me. It's funny how, you know, if, if you've dealt with alcoholism, if you've dealt with addiction, you can tell those stories about who I used to be and who I am. And it's funny how even when you start realizing who you used to be, you see God in the middle of all of that. You see God working in the middle of all of it. And I'm going to tell you, it's funny, in the middle of 28... He brings light on their drunkenness. He brings light on their sin. At the end of 28, they're mocking and they're making fun and they're laughing in their drunken stupor. But right in the dead center, right in the middle, in verse 5, it says, In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory. Listen to me. If you're tired of this fading crown that comes with the life you're living, 
If you're tired of having to lie to people and keep secrets from people, if you're tired of having to shift around things and make sure that nobody finds out and make sure that, you know, your, your wife's not finding out, your kids aren't finding out, you know, your work's not finding out. If you're tired of that fading crown, God says that there is a crown of glory, a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. He says, look, for those who will choose me, and that's what it is. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you. Listen, you have a choice to make today, right now. You have to choose. We've already chosen for you. Your family has already chosen for you. They've already told you they're sick of it. Your children have already said, we're tired of not having you around. They, you've heard it. Nobody else can choose for you. You have to choose today that Christ means more to me. Not your family. Not your family. Because God forbid your family pass, and now all of a sudden that anchor that held you, they're gone. And so I'm going back to alcohol, right? Not your job. This money is more important. No, because when you lose your job, you're back to the bottle. And it's not you. You're flaky. Don't put it on you. Just being honest, we're flaky as a people. I'm doing this. Today, I'm doing it. Well, guess what? Today ain't tomorrow. And tomorrow, trouble's going to hit. The bank account's going to be low. Things are going to you know, be going wrong. The air conditioner goes out. And you're like, oh, I've got to get a drink, right? The one unchanging thing in your life should be your relationship with Christ because He is unchanging. And because He is unchanging... I base everything off of Him. You, Jesus, are worth more to me than this addiction. You are now the passion in my life. You are the thing which anchors me and holds me because you are unchanging. And because you are unchanging, my decision today will be unchanging. Stress is going to hit tomorrow. It's going to happen. But I'm going to go to you, not the bottle. Here's the thing. He is a crown of glory, a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment. Who's the one that sits in judgment? That ain't you. That's Christ. He will be given a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment. You know what justice is? If you've been confronted today with your secret sin, if you've been confronted today with your out-and-out -out sin, and you get up from here, and your sin continues to run your life, Christ will sit in judgment, perfect justice of you. But I hate my sin. That's awesome. I hate my sin too. That doesn't make me saved. I hate your sin. It doesn't make you saved. The justice is twofold. He's going to judge me and I'm either going to find unfortunate justice because I chose my sin, or He's going to look at me and I'm going to find unlimited mercy. Because there was nothing that was worth more than Him. And I get to look at Him and go, now listen, let's just be honest for a second. Guys, 100%, I think I'm going to look at Jesus and go, that was a struggle. I don't think I'm going to get to heaven and look at Jesus and go, man, that was the easiest thing I've ever done. No. I think I'm going to look at him and I'm going to go, Lord, God, that was rough. You know what his response is going to be? I know. And he can say, I know. Because Christ, God wrapped in flesh, who dealt with every human desire. He knew what gluttony was. He was hungry. He knew what drunkenness was. He drank. For those of you that say, Jesus didn't drink, he did. Jesus said, you call me a glutton and a drunkard because I eat and I drink with tax collectors and sinners. So he had to have been drinking because the people were like, look, he's drinking, he's a drunk. Jesus was like, I'm not drunk. He knew what it tasted like. And he didn't let it control him because his will submitted constantly to the Father. Guys, listen to me. To be more Christ-like does not mean 
that we're going to be perfect. We're never going to achieve perfection. And if you're trying to achieve perfection in you, you're going to fail. And that's going to push you right back into that addiction. Here's what being Christ-like is. Submitting to the will of the Father daily. Daily. Hourly. Minute to minute. I was fine five minutes ago. And then these kids over here, right? And I have to submit. I have to submit. He loves you. That's the one thing I can tell you. He absolutely loves you. And he says this, the strength will come to those who turn back the battle at the gate. He will give strength in that day to those that turn back the battle at the gate. Guys, some days you're going to wake up and it's going to feel like you are defending yourself from every assault of hell. You're going to wake up and you're going to stand at the gate and you're just going to battle. You'll go home and you'll be wore out and all you did was not drink. But because you were at a battle all day, you will go home and you will be tired. But here's the thing. In your tiredness, there will be victory. You'll be wore out, but you'll end the day and you'll go, one day. One day at a time. That's that old song. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Tomorrow, I'm going to wake up and Satan's coming. Give me tomorrow too. Give me the next day. God, just let me stand and let me fight. Guys, it's not just drinking. It's all of our addictions. It's all of our issues. It's all of our sin that we hold so close to our chest that we go, this is how I cope through life. Guys, God commands us. We have to, we have to lay that stuff down. We have to be done. That's a difficult thing, but I'm telling you today that there is freedom in it. There's freedom in it. And I will tell you, listen to me very carefully. Fighting it does not mean that you go home and you lock yourself in the house alone. In fact, Fighting it means all that secret stuff that you've been doing is time to start telling the truth. And the more people that know and the people that know who do not judge you, who love you and who come around you and who walk you through this and will be by your side as you walk through this, that's where you get victory. Isolation is the worst thing you can do for sin. Confrontation. It's time to get confrontational. As loud and as belligerent and as stubborn as you get when you're drunk, I need you to be that sober. I need you to be that towards your alcoholism. It's time. Towards every one of our sin, it's time. Lay it down. Guys, if you're here and you need a relationship with Jesus, it starts with, it has to start with, it has to. Listen. None of this works if you start in pride. It has to start in surrender. That's the whole thing. God looked at them and said, your drunkenness and your pride. I, I hate your pride. Because they looked and said, what's wrong with us? You know what he tells them at the end of this? This is the reason I teach the way I do, by the way. If you've ever wondered why we go chapter by chapter, line by line, and you're like, oh, we read so much of the Bible at Anthony Drive. They mock God and they go, well, you act like we're babies. You act like we need it block by block, line by line. Listen to me. After they mock it, Isaiah repeats it. And he looks at him and he says, the way that you do this is precept upon precept. Truth upon truth. Line upon line. Block upon block. You may not be ready to tackle alcoholism today, but you may be, able to ready, you may be ready to tackle pride. Today may be the day that you go, my chest has been puffed out for too long. I have to surrender. That's where it starts. The surrender, the humility to step up and to go, God, I can't do this. I've tried to do this. I can't. I can't, I can't get out of this sin. The relationship with Jesus starts when you realize your sin and you realize your need for Him. You realize that humility. When He draws you in that. Guys, if you're here today and you need a relationship, we're going to do this the old school way. 
old school way. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to say amen. And if you're staying for the business meeting, you're more than welcome. You can come up here and you can get ready. If you need to be dismissed, you're going to come out the back. As you're walking out, if you need to talk with me, I want you to grab me and say, hey, I need to talk with you. I need to pray with you. And I'd love to talk with you some more. I'd love to pray with you. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. I thank you, Father, for victory that is found in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, that there is no sin today. There's no sin in us. There's nothing that you can't handle. There's nothing stronger than you. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord, that today, whatever our sin is, whether it's our drunkenness, whether it's pride, whether it's whatever, God, I just pray that you would just bring that to the surface. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand our need for you and our need to let go of these earthly things that have captivated us, that have swallowed us up. Father, I pray that you would just help us. God, I pray that you would guide us. Father, for those of us that know you, that have a head knowledge of you, and we love you, and we are caught up in sin, Father, I pray that you would give us the strength to stand every day and to say no more and to be done with that sin. Father, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you, I pray, God, that they would help, that, that, that you would help them just to, just to come to know you before it's too late. Father, that their, their arrogance... Father, that you would break that down. God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you are long-suffering and patient with us. I thank you, Father, that the man I was is not the man that I am. And I thank you, Father, that the man that I am now is not the man that I'm going to be, that you are purifying and sanctifying, and you are watching over me and holding my hand through all of this, and I praise you for that. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to guide Lord, I love you. Father, I pray that you do a great thing here today. God, I pray that you would do a great thing here today. Lord, I love you. I thank you and I praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.